Welcome to the Everblack Podcast. On this episode, we talk Lords of Chaos with director Jonas Akerlund, who took some time out with his very busy schedule with Ramstein to join us on the program and give us a bit of insight into the production of the movie and uh, the challenges of taking on the project. Right now, though, to talk about the movie, we are joined by my good buddy Shane Smith. Thanks for joining us on the show, man. How are you going? Good, man. It's good to be here. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, spending your Saturday night uh, down here in the uh, studio-ish. First off, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, what it's about, the movie is an adaption of the book by the same name by Michael Moynihan and Diedrich Sodelin that chronicled a series of shocking crimes in Norway in the early 1990s committed by founders of the black metal bands Mayhem and Burzum and subsequently blew the lid off the underground Scandinavian black metal scene and set in motion a whole series of events that made the genre notorious even today. Now, you have read the book and saw the movie at a one-off screening last night, and I saw it a couple of days ago, and I've been waiting to uh, pick your brains about it a little bit in regards to what you thought about it and uh, how it differs from the book. Now, keeping in mind that they had to cram a lot into a two-hour movie plus make it somewhat accessible for mainstream audiences, do, do you think that they covered it to the best of their ability? Um, yeah, I do, actually. There was some events that weren't in the film, but I think that um, with all the extra added characters that were in the book, say, you had people involved that were from Emperor and other bands that did do other things as well, like as far as church burnings and other activities. I think it's it was probably better that they just focus on Mayhem and, and Burzum as well, because uh, in the movie, like, the, the main guy of, of Burzum was in Mayhem for a time as well, so... Yeah, I think it probably is better that way. But for me, I would have liked to have seen... I don't know, it would have been like cool to see like everything included from the book. Um, just from reading the book, you know, you just expect a certain thing when you see the movie, and when you don't see it, it's like, oh, what the hell. But um, no, it does make sense why they did it, and especially for people that don't know the scene at all, just to watch a movie. And yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. What would you say were the most noticeable changes uh, from the book... And, and the story, obviously, it's it's based on, on something that really happened. W- what's the most noticeable things to you? Uh, one thing I didn't expect to see was um, Euronymous with a girlfriend. Because that wasn't mentioned in the book at all. I was like, okay, he's got a girlfriend now. But um, as far as like you know, being a movie, I thought it had a bit more emotional weight to it. Especially towards the end. Because, um, well, if, you know, if, if you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it. But like, it does make sense. You know, just to make the movie more effective, um, having the girlfriend there for Euronymous. That was uh, the main thing that was like, that I can really think about off the top of my head. Yeah. Do you think it, it humanized him a little bit more? Because I know that's one thing that a, a couple of people were a bit um, a bit concerned about, it, I should say, was the fact that he he did ha- have a romantic relationship in the movie. I'm sure he did in real life, but they haven't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you think that's something that that humanised him a little bit? Well, I thought, like, especially in the end as well, you know, I think that that's what happened. Yeah, it's weird from going from the book to the movie. Like, in some ways I thought in the, like, some of the you know, characters, the, the people that were in the movie, they felt a bit more humanised in the book, but also they felt a bit, some of them felt more humanised in the movie and vice versa. I don't know. It's it's different. Like everyone's different when they read a book and when what they think when they see the movie as well. So a bit of both, really. I'm still wrapping my head around because I just saw it last night. So yeah, s- still processing all of it. It's definitely you know not for the faint of heart either, as uh, the violence in it is extremely graphic. I mean, it actually sat with me for a few days. I could not stop thinking about it and how in your face some of those scenes actually were. How was the audience reaction? When you were in there, did you did you hear people sort of being affected by that? Um, it was weird because, like, you know, the, the the murder scenes and stuff, they were graphic. But um, the audience was pretty calm for pretty much all of it. Except for the one part with... But just, like, when you walk... When they, I think it was Euronymous, he walks in the room. And I don't, wanna, I don't really want to spoil it, but, like, when he walks in Dead's room, he has a cat hanging from the roof. And one of the chicks in the audience was like, oh, my God, that's so messed up, blah, blah, blah. And that was, like, the only time that I actually heard something. That was, like, it seems like that was the most shocking thing to see an animal getting killed before humans. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was the main thing. 
Yeah, it, it definitely left an impression on me, and I, I definitely challenged quite a few people. That's that's the only thing I could put it to is it's it's definitely a challenging movie, but it, uh, it I thought it was brilliant, and you know I know there's a lot of hardcore fans out there that you know just need to understand that you know it's got to appeal to both uh, the hardcore fans and and uh, the, your general audience. Because, you know, as it pops up at the start, it says based on truth, lies, and uh, what actually happened. So, um, The original bass player who's still in the band, Necro Butcher, um, he was actually best friends with Dead, like in real life. And it doesn't really show that in the movie, but I guess it would have been cool to see that. But uh, it's, I don't know. It would have made it way more messed up if they actually showed them being friends, yeah. like as best mates, and then... Him just, you know, doing what he does. So um, I guess I understand why they left it out. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I was going to say, you know, is there something that you could have, you know, you think they could have included? But, uh, yeah, so I, I do agree. That's that maybe an element they could have included to, um, to give it a bit more. But, you know, m- who knows? Maybe it could be expanded as a, a Netflix series or something like that to dig a little deeper. But uh, who knows? Yeah, because like, um, well, as far as I know, is the Euronymous's parents are still alive and he had a sister and stuff. So it would have been weird. Like, obviously, they wanted to make this movie, but they would have had to have, I don't know, some acceptance from the parents to let them do this. So I guess like they would have had to change some things just to make it better for them to accept it. Who knows? But the director would have had to, have, you know, change just to make it happen. Yeah. And um, and everyone involved as well. So I don't know. It is a whole, the whole thing's a messed up situation. Especially when, like, you know, you might have his parents going, oh, you can do this, you can't do that or not. So, um, I don't know. It's something to think about. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. It's definitely uh, probably one of the best movies I've seen in a very long time. And uh, Jonas Ackerland, uh, who is the director, has directed so many major video clips for so many big bands. And this project, as he said in the interview, uh, he was very passionate about this and it took him quite a while to uh, get it off the ground. So, uh, yeah, but it took him a little while. So uh, I'm glad that he got to do it and got it out in the world. Awesome, man. Well, uh, before we go into the interview, we do have to mention that this episode is brought to you by Blacklight Art and Design, who are our go-to for all our screen printing needs. Check those guys out at www blacklightad.com.au show is also brought to you by our good friends at RW Promotion who are the best in the biz when it comes to stickers, flyers, banners, badges and all other promo you need for your band or business. Go to www.rwpromotion.com.au and check them out. And I also want to give a shout out to Lumberpunk's Axe Throwing Club who now have two venues in Queensland. One in Miami on the Gold Coast and the other in West End in Brisbane. Now if you may Mention Ever Black in your booking notes. You receive 10% off your session, which is a, a great deal. And I want to say thank you to those guys for uh, giving that to all our listeners. Check them out at www.lumberpunks.com. Here is my interview with Jonas Akeland about Lords of Chaos. Shout out to The Faction, Monster Pictures and Marrick Media for making that happen. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube and Everblack podcast through iTunes. Uh, And also my buddy Shane Smith, thanks for uh, being on the show, bro. Cheers, mate. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, stay tuned. Here is the interview with Jonas Akeland about Lords of Chaos. Enjoy. Jonas, how are you, mate? Uh, I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. All good here. Busy, busy, brother. I mean, back to back, you've just been doing phoners for uh, Lords of Chaos like crazy, I, I, I could imagine. Yeah, it's been a lot of Lords of Chaos, and then uh, my other movie, Polar, came out a few weeks ago, and then I'm I'm also shooting some music videos right now, so I'm kind of like, yeah, busy as always, I guess. Of course, I watched Lords of Chaos. Uh, the other night and uh, it just blew me away it's actually it's stuck with me it's the first movie I've watched in a long time that has actually left me really thinking and maybe even a little bit disturbed afterwards knowing that it was uh, on fact you you know I, I'm a big fan of your previous work like Spun and your music videos and I can't really mm. think of anyone else who could have handled this in the way you did it, it's just amazing mate in saying that I can imagine it was quite a 
daunting project to, to take on to begin with. Is that right? Well, uh, thank you for all the kind words. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks for watching it and, like, everything. Yeah, well, you know, it's like it's just one of those things that kind of got stuck with me for, for a long time. And mm. I, I, I don't know why, but I, I walked around thinking that I own this story and it's mine and I'm closer to it than everybody else. And I, I was very protective with it. It's like every, you know, I thought, I thought I own, I thought it was mine, you know, for, for years. And then I realized that there's a lot of other people feeling the same, you know, and I, mm started to think that we've seen the documentaries, we read the books, and there's so much material online and pictures and and all that, but behind all this, there's like this young voice, you know, and we kind of never seen that part of it, you know, so I really wanted to go deeper and under- try to understand and just, you know, go a little deeper in the relationship between these boys. I think that what hit me the hardest was watching them because they're just young I mean they were just young dudes just growing up and figuring things out and in the back of my mind watching it knowing that this is something that actually happened at the end of it that's what really hit home and I think you taking on that that's that that would have been such a massive massive project and, and taking a lot of balls man if you don't mind me saying and I mean you've but you've in your previous videos and stuff like that you've always seem to be someone who pushes buttons and, and tests people and, and pushes the envelope a little bit more. Is that something that, you know, toughened you up and really prepared you for this this moment? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I mean, I never really thought about it the way you say it. I mean, I keep mm. I keep hearing that, but, you know, to me, I always try to, I mean, I, I love the, the fact that with filmmaking that you could actually touch people and affect people. Mm. And, you know, with, with my dyslexia and my uh, language barrier, I always used filmmaking as, as a way of expressing myself. And I, I always love the, how I can affect it hard with, like, you know, with the help of editing and sound and music and you know the way what I do you know so I've always pushed that you know whatever the emotion may be I've always used the techniques to go far with it I never really thought about uh, I never really thought about it until people afterwards mention it it's like in the <laughs> making of I never think about it you know and but I think you're right with one thing is that in a weird way a lot of things I've done the last 20 years kind of led up to Lords of Chaos. You know, I felt, I, I said to a lot of people that I work with that it almost feels like my first film, you know. Mm. It feels like, you know, I, 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 I fought for it in a different way that I've ever done with any other project. And I, I did feel close to it much more than I've done with anything else. And I did have the courage to actually write it myself, which is was a big thing for me. And, uh, you know, I just... You know, it just like felt a little different than other things I've done. It's it's just amazing, mate, and it's definitely gotten people talking. That's for sure. I mean, it's blown up on social media, websites, everything like that. Sure. And uh, you've you've got to be proud, mate. You've got to absolutely be proud of what you've uh, achieved here. But congratulations, mate. Yeah. I know I keep giving uh, I mean, you praises, but it, it's really. I know, no, but that's. I mean, that's great, and it, it warms my heart. You know, and I, I it really does. You know, and sometimes when because as a director for music videos and commercials, you are kind of like always thinking about everybody else and you're a director mm-hmm. on hire, you know, to fulfill somebody else's dream. And, and I feel like once in a while I get a chance with my short films and my dance film and my art projects. And, and now finally this movie, I got a chance to kind of fulfill my own vision in a different way. I guess Spawn was a little bit the same, you know. When I did Spawn, mm. I didn't really care about anything other than just, like, <laughs> well, how I saw the movie, you know. So I've kind of done it before, but uh, it felt a little extra with this one. Awesome, man. And, of course, Rory Culkin stars as Euronymous. Now, he he's a phenomenal actor, but I wouldn't have picked him initially for the part, you know, when, when I read it. But now, after seeing it, like, he's he's perfectly cast. Was that a long process, casting everyone in the film to get them right? Yeah, I mean, it was because, number one, it took so long to make this movie. When you cast boys around that age, you know, they they can change so much. You cast somebody when they're 18, and two years later, 
they look like grown men with deep voices and beards. You know, so, <laughs> luckily for me, Rory has a baby face <laughs> still. <laughs> he, he's still he's not he's not that young, but he definitely play plays young on camera. Uh, and he was the first one in actually, and he stayed loyal to the project, even though it took so many years to get it made. Mm. He stayed loyal to the project, so I knew I had my Euronymous, and from that I could build and find the chemistry between the other characters in the film. So it, the fact that I had Rory made it a little easier, actually. And, uh, you know, Jack Kilmer was just like, when he walked into the room, he actually came in to meet me for Varg, but when he walked into the room, I was like, okay, that's, that's Pelle. I, I could just see him as Pelle, you know, so... You know, it was a li- it was a process for sure, and the fact that it took so long was the difficult part. Yeah, I can imagine from the actor's perspective as well that these roles were also quite challenging to take on, as it, you know they're they're based on real people. Uh, did you, what advice did you have for these guys going into it to to help prepare them? I mean, there there, there was so much research material, and mm. uh, I had done all the research for them. So they basically walked into, you know, a smorgasbord of stuff for them to work with. If it was the, you know, it could have been the wig, it could have been the, the instrument, it could be the leather jacket, it could be the characters, the pictures, like all the stories, all the documentaries, all the books. Like there was so much for them to, to use as actors. Uh, and my big job was not to read lines and make sure they memorize the lines. My big job was to get them prepared and get them into character, you know. So mm. playing, uh, rehearsing their instruments and hanging together as a black circle and have, wearing the wigs and reading about it and talking about it and spending time together was our big research. So once we started the shoot, uh, which was, by the way, we shot this movie in 18 days, which is kind of yeah. like very short. So once we were shooting, they were just like in character. There was, there was no question about what the characters were all about and who they were. And it was, you know, because usually as a director, you get, uh, you get a lot of questions from the actors about the characters. But because we had that free time together, they were all so in character. And it was actually, it was actually great to see at the end of the shoot how difficult it was for these actors to separate from their characters. Like Rory, he stole his leather jacket. He didn't want to take off his wig. He wanted a guitar. He wanted to, he wanted to like continue be Euronymous, even though he dies in the movie and he left for another movie. He still wanted to stay in character. It's just insane. And and some of the scenes in the movie are quite violently graphic, even for me, man. Like, I, I I'll throw this in. I did like your little uh, Evil Dead and brain dead uh, little cut scenes in mm-hmm. there when they're watching that. Very mm-hmm. nice, very nice. I'm mm-hmm. fans. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, as someone who's grown up with, you know, watching horror movies and stuff like that, it, those scenes for me were very, very confronting, especially the suicide scene. You probably watched this with audiences. How have the reactions been sitting there in, in a theatre with people watching these? I mean, it's 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 been... I've done a lot of it, actually. I, I've been to... Uh, quite a few screenings by now mm. and the reason the reason why I love to do it is just to feel that energy in the room uh, you know and just feel how it turns you know from those horrible moments to a laugh to emotional moments to like really like follow the audience and I, I now I spend more time like looking around in the room than I do watching the movie you know, I've been doing I've been doing films all my life, and I got about four million billion I got four billion hits on YouTube, and I never ever sit next to my audience. You know, I never really get a chance to do that. So I'm enjoying every minute of it, and I I know that there's you know now a lot of people come in a little bit more prepared, but there is an element of surprise in these in the in the murder scenes because mm. they kind of come out of no, nowhere, you know, and. Uh, I mean, it's tough. Some people have a hard time to get out of it. Like once they've seen that scene, it's it's tough for them to move on, you know. But to me, they the, the extreme ups and downs in this movie are very important. You know, I think that as much as I wanted to go emotional, I wanted to go deep, and it was, you know, the dark stuff. You know, I really wanted to go all the way in all the emotions in the film. I think at the end of it, it's the main reason why you feel for these characters is because you yes. have those moments. 
Absolutely. And I mean, there's the, uh, you know, the, even the last 15 minutes, 20, 15 minutes of the, the movie was really, really intense. In a way, I just found it like really humanized Euronymous as well and made Varg mm. like, it was interesting to watch and how how it was so drawn out. Like, it's it's really stuck with me, man. And I think a lot of people are saying the same thing. And, of course, it says, you know, at the start, based on truth and uh, uh, lies and what actually happened. You know, and as I know, like, as a filmmaker, you know, you change some things for storytelling's sake. I mean, how have you found the response to some of those little changes that you've made? No, I mean, I, I think... Uh, uh... I think uh, your normal viewer doesn't really care, you know. I mean, the fact yeah. that a lot of these things actually happen makes it shocking for a lot of people that didn't know mm-hmm. the story. And, uh, you know, a lot of them end up in front of their computer right after, like, cannot believe what they find online, you know. But for me, it's, it's, it's funny because the first poster I made on this movie I put based on truth. And then, it, and then it took me a little while before I realized, like, wait a minute, I'm making a movie here. So it's true, but it's kind of like a lot of people's different truths, and it's like my twisting it a little bit for, because I'm making a movie. So I added lies. And then on my second poster, and then, <laughs> then when the movie was done, I met somebody who said to me, well, it's your truth and it's my truth, and then it's what actually happened, he said to me. And I was like, shit, man, you're right. It's... it's the truth, and it is lies, but then it's also what actually happened, because we know that four people died. We know that mm. a certain amount of churches burned down. We know there is a long list of stuff that actually happened that you can't really argue. You know, so that's why it became like this third thing, and, and then I had to redo the poster for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you heard from like uh, Hell Hammer and uh, Attila or Necro Butcher from Mayhem, or even gotten feedback from like Fenris Satyr or you know even Euronymous? No. family? yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been involved, uh, I've been in contact with uh, uh, Euronymous parents, uh, Pella's brother Ambes, Necro Butcher, and Hell Hammer uh, from day one. I needed the music. I could not make this movie without the music. So they were involved. They, they read the script early. They gave me the blessing for the music. I couldn't move on without it. So, and then Attila was because we shot uh, a big part of this movie in Budapest. Attila was uh, hanging on set, and his son is actually playing him in the movie. So uh, Attila is a dear friend of mine too. So he was very close to the whole the whole shoot and to me like those were the people that I really cared about that I felt were important to have involved you know and uh, they were always there I know it's been like a lot of rumor about you know all that stuff which I didn't really I don't really care about you know I know I know the relationship I have with these people and and Mm -hmm. I love them for being there for me and uh, you know I can I can't thank them enough you know that's awesome to hear and I'm glad that you know you, you you address that that you, you're friends yeah. and stuff. That's 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 awesome. In saying that, though, you're a busy dude. Do you ever get on the kit? I mean, do you ever get get on the drum kit yourself? Um, like no, I don't. I mean, I did stop pretty abrupt when I discovered uh, filmmaking and especially film editing. Yeah, it became yep. it became uh, my big thing in life, and I realized that I'm so much better in editing than I ever was as a drummer. You know, it came very natural for me. So I, I kind of never looked back, but, uh, you know, it's like once a year or so, I feel like maybe I should do a little bit, but I don't. <laughs> get, get, get those chops back up. You never know. Go on tour. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Go back as a battery. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben, I'm actually hanging to see Polar this way. I haven't seen it yet, and I'm been hanging to watch it. So uh, I've stayed away from trailers uh, and spoilers, and uh, I just want to enjoy it. So, oh, great. It's very different from Lords of Chaos. It's very absolutely. different. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's like a Jonas week in my household. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, uh, great. That's great. So uh, what's next for you, man? You've got some videos coming out, another movie? Yeah, well, I haven't started my next movie yet, but I'm entertaining a few different options here. And uh, yeah, I'm doing a couple of videos right now. I'm doing uh, working with a German band called Rammstein. Oh, some band called Ramstein? 
some little bands called Rand Yeah, I don't know how big they are in Australia. I'm sorry. They're huge. No, but, they're huge. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I worked with Rammstein for years, and they yeah. have a new album, which is uh, amazing, because that doesn't happen uh, so often. So, uh, yeah, I was just in Berlin shooting, working with them. So that's, that's the thing I'm working on right now. Unreal, man. Had you heard the, their new album? You'd probably be the only one. If you have, uh, yeah, I heard like six, five or six songs. I've heard, so I've heard uh, a lot of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Of course, because you're directing the video. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, wow, lucky man, lucky man. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a big fan. I always, I always loved Rammstein. You know, they're they're my one of my favorite bands to work with too. They're great to work with. Oh, I mean, and uh, Smashing Pumpkins was another one. My favorite band of all time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen I haven't seen much from them in a while, but I know Billy is touring, and I I I, mm. I see him I see him once in a while, but I haven't I haven't worked in a while. And he yeah, yeah of course he wrote uh, music to my movie Spun. He was he right. scored it for, yeah. And he was the doctor, wasn't he? And he was the doctor. That was the deal. He was like, I write the music, but you have to give me a role. So I gave <laughs> him like a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember watching it going. Is it Billy Corgan? Even <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a wig. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, mate, Billy's great. Billy's I'm great. a massive fan. Oh, I'm a massive fan. Well, Jonas, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. And I wish you all the best with uh, all your upcoming projects. And uh, Lords of Chaos, kicking ass all over the world. All right, great. Well, have, have fun watching Polar, too. And uh, I hope I talk to you again one day. Absolutely, mate. You have a good night. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.